Hello, it's Dr. Karen here. I hope you're doing well today. Um, today we're gonna be talking about headaches. So I'll be sharing with you five unexpected causes for recurrent headaches. But before I dive into that, I just wanted to give you a reminder uh, to make sure that you follow us on Facebook so you get a notification as soon as we uh, go live. And to get notification ahead of time, make sure you use that uh, link in the video description now so that you can get our schedule and video notes into your uh, inbox. Um, okay, if you are joining us now, give me a little hello so I can see who's there. Um, and of course, feel free to post questions at any time. If I don't get to them uh, right away, I will shortly afterwards. So today I wanted to share the common causes of headaches so you can figure out what's going on with your headaches and of course, how to get started on reducing uh, the recurrence of those headaches. So I wanted to talk about headaches because it is so common. Uh, almost half of adults get headaches. And while there's some in some classifications, hundreds of different kinds of headaches, the most common types of headaches that I see are tension headaches and migraine headaches. And we'll go into more about what those uh, look like. But migraine headaches can be um, recurrent and they can be quite severe. So we'll definitely be talking more about that. Now, headaches are uh, personal for me. I've uh, been affected uh, by headaches since I was at least in my teens, uh, particularly in university, I remember getting them regularly. And at that time, I had a lot of neck tension. You would often see me kind of rubbing my neck as I'm studying or even just sitting in the lecture hall um, I could never find a really comfortable position for my neck. Uh, even when I was sleeping, there was no position that felt like I could relax my neck fully. Um, now, I knew even at that time too, that that stress and studying for hours and being hunched over at my desk and not sleeping particularly regularly. Um, and then of course, lack of exercise. I knew that all of these things weren't helping with my neck pain and my head pain. So. When I graduated uh, and I took a few years off to travel, uh, I expected my headaches to be better. Well, it changed, but it wasn't better. My headaches uh, just changed to a different quality. Now, I didn't really have as much neck pain, um, but now I had these throbbing headaches that seemed to come out of nowhere. So at that time, I was traveling, I was having a great time, I didn't have any exams, I didn't have any deadlines, um, but I still would have these headaches that would pop up seemingly out of nowhere and it would be there for a day, sometimes even two days. Um, and what was awful was just having to divide my attention between that head pain and then everything else that was going on in my life with the travel and everything. Um, and I, I could see at that point that some of the triggers and things that would make it worse. So I definitely knew that going outside in the bright light made it worse. Even moving, like from sitting to standing would make it feel worse. Um, even eating would make it feel worse. So at the, really at the end of the day, all I wanted to do was just sit in the dark and do nothing. Does that sound familiar to you? Maybe this is something that you have experienced. Um, for me, what was even worse was that it seemed random, like I didn't know where the headache was coming from. Um, and you know, if I had hit my head and felt head pain, that would be kind of clear and it would make sense to me, but it was just kind of coming out of nowhere and I would have this pounding uh, pain in my head uh, without any kind of visible signs of injury. And that was really difficult because it was made it really hard to relate my experience to other people. Um, and for other people to relate to my experience. So it was very isolating. And this is something that I've heard from my, my patients as well, that migraines can be really, not just painful, but isolating. Um, what are your headaches like? Have you noticed similar types of things like certain foods that trigger it or lights, uh, smells, even weather changes? Uh, what about timing of when they come up? Like, is it coming up at certain times of day? Is it coming at a certain time, um, like you're waking up with your headaches? 
or are there meals that trigger it? Are you getting them at certain times of your cycle? Have you noticed that they come on with stress or sometimes coming on once the stress is over and you sigh that sense of relief, that's when your headaches come on. Have you noticed your headaches with uh, viral colds or sinus issues or dental issues, uh, sleep issues, even uh, drinking too much coffee or stopping coffee certainly can trigger it as well. Migraines and headaches can really disrupt every part of your life. Uh, even trying to rest is really difficult. Sleep is difficult even with a migraine. Um, and certainly working and trying to take care of family, even just uh, enjoying a sunny, nice day can be uh, hard on if you have a headache. Migraines are one of the leading causes of missed work days in Canada. And in fact, people who have chronic migraines actually report an average of 40 days of, uh, of work uh, per year where they're actually going to work, but they're not able to function fully. So I think this definitely shows uh, what I experienced, which is how debilitating it is, but also just that difficulty for other people to relate to what's happening. So if patients don't feel like their employers or their coworkers are gonna be very supportive or understanding about what's going on. So that really um, makes it further isolating to us when it seems like it's almost easier to just keep going like, it's, like nothing is happening. Um, and of course, the sense of isolation that by itself is a significant risk factor for poor health and certainly can uh, contribute to the cycle of headaches and migraines as well. Now, medications can be really helpful to get us through the day, uh, but they do have some long-term issues. Uh, some things like acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, is known to reduce our ability to be able to protect our body from inflammation. And this is important because with uh, headaches, brain inflammation is a key factor in this. Um, on top of that, there's common migraine medications that uh, can be really helpful in reducing intensity of migraines uh, if we're, it's taken early enough. But these kinds of medications, uh, if it's more frequently used, can increase that likelihood of rebound headaches as well as increase the need for more medications. So obviously with these medications, it can be really helpful in the short term. They're not great as a long-term solution. And of course, the, one of the biggest issues with these is that they just simply don't address the underlying cause of those headaches. Um, and another problem with them is that they don't address the potential risks that are associated with headaches uh, what I mean by that is, for example, there are there's one migraine type called migraine with aura that carries with it a risk factor for stroke um, and heart disease. And so if we're just trying to get rid of the pain in the moment and not doing anything else to uh, address the cause of that migraine, uh, we're not addressing those risk factors for those serious conditions as well. So let me just clarify a little bit about tension versus migraine headaches. So you heard me describe my experience um, generally having tension headaches in the beginning in university where it was more of this kind of muscle tightness. Oftentimes it's in the neck uh, as well as in the head feeling like, uh, like a tight band around the head. It can and, um, be anywhere on the head. It often is in the back, uh, but it can certainly be anywhere on the head. Whereas a migraine tends to feel more like a throbbing pain. Um, and almost always it's on one side of the head. It doesn't have to be, but uh, most of the time it is one side of the head, and it often comes with other symptoms. Um, that could be nausea or uh, light and sound sensitivity. You can have visual disturbances, which we call aura, uh, dizziness as well. Um, and migraines can last from a few hours to even a two or three days. So. It's, they tend to last a little bit longer um, depending on what's going on compared to like a tension headache. Now, migraines do seem a little bit mysterious and our current understanding about what's happening there 
is that there's this chain of events that's triggered in the brain and it amplifies itself uh, and that disrupts our pain sensory systems. So it's a lot like a uh, short circuiting of our causing a fire alarm to go off when there's no fire. We have, we feel the pain even when there's no injury there. Uh, and once this uh, brain system is activated, you, we can see changes in blood flow and nerve activity uh, in the brain. Now, it does appear to be that there's multiple factors that contribute to activating this pain pathway um, in the brain. So it's a little bit like uh, filling up a bucket, that there's multiple factors that fill up this bucket um, over time. And when it finally reaches the a threshold, it, the bucket overflows. And that's when that chain of events is activated and uh, you start to experience that head pain. Um, and so in my experience, just removing uh, one or two food triggers, although it's a good place to start, is just isn't enough to actually prevent those headaches from coming back. It's really, the key here is really to understand what's filling up your bucket uh, and we then work on emptying that so that we can actually heal the brain health and make sure that we're less susceptible to those triggers. So what's actually filling up the, the bucket? Here are five common causes that I see uh, that are common but might be a little bit surprising. So the first one is blood sugar imbalance. So have you ever gotten a headache after skipping a meal? Um, our brain is really sensitive to what our blood glucose levels are. And our hormone systems are designed to keep our blood glucose in this uh, narrow and healthy uh, range. So that if our blood glucose starts to get too low, say a couple hours after we've eaten, our hormones are supposed to get activated to bring the glucose out of storage and then increase our blood sugar levels. But if your hormone system isn't 100% healthy, our blood glucose starts to drop and it continues to drop. And when it gets too low, that actually triggers our stress systems to uh, trigger the release of cortisol and adrenaline. And that's why you can feel all of these like stress type of responses like lightheadedness or shakiness, sweating, irritability, uh, racing heart, uh, hangry uh, feeling, even nausea. And that low blood sugar can also affect our blood vessels um, effect and triggering headaches. And now, I see this pattern happening often um, with people who have high insulin levels. Now, this is not something that most people know that they have. Um, it's not typically measured or not commonly measured. Um, but if you're somebody who tends to get these uh, low blood sugar type of symptoms two or three hours after you've eaten or um, after you skip a meal or you're somebody that really needs to uh, carry a granola bar just in case, um, it could be a little bit of a hint that this might be an issue for you. So high insulin levels might be uh, preventing your body from being able to adjust its blood sugar uh, during that uh, that fasting phase in between your meals. Um, so one of the ways, of course, to improve this is to uh, avoid skipping meals, of course, um, and just making sure that we're eating regularly, but also working towards designing your meals to be insulin friendly, meaning that we don't trigger those that insulin too much when you're eating so that you can actually fast uh, comfortably four or five hours between your meals without snacking. So avoiding sugar, avoiding refined carbohydrates, uh, things like pop and pasta and baked goods can be really, really helpful for this. And then making sure that we have a good, healthy portion of proteins, fats with every meal and plenty of fiber. All of those will help to just even out your blood sugar um, in between your meals and avoid those big ups and downs. Uh, there was one uh, study that was looking at children with migraines and the only intervention that they did in the study is just increasing uh, the fiber content in these children's diet and that showed that 
the children's migraines improved. And that I'm, I've seen that also in my practice in adults as well being really helpful. So just adding more fiber in your diet can just help to balance out that blood sugar. If low blood sugar is an issue for you, another thing to look at is just how healthy your adrenal function is. Um, and you can recover adrenal function really well with regular good quality sleep uh, and really good routine, uh, day and night routine with strong circadian rhythms. So making sure that your day and night rhythms are matched up with nature's day and night rhythms. That's really great to recover adrenal function, which will help to also uh, support uh, more even blood sugar. So that's your first cause is blood sugar imbalance. Second big cause for recurrent headaches is hormone imbalance. Now, some of you probably already had a little hint of this just looking at your own patterns of headaches and migraines. 85% um, of migraine sufferers are women. And so that gives us, again, a hint that the cycling, the changes in hormones might be contributing to some of our headaches. So what I see most commonly when it comes to migraines are with women is that they come just before or with the period. And what's happening during that time is that there's this little sudden drop of estrogen around that time. Even if you might have actually relatively high uh, levels of estrogen on the rest of your cycle, there can be a little drop in estrogen just in that timing before your period and at the beginning of the period. And that can sort of trigger that headache to come up at that point. Now, estrogen actually has quite a, an effect on all, so many different things in the body, but in terms of headaches, it can actually affect how excitable the nerves can be and our blood vessels can be in our brain. And it actually interacts with uh, our brain chemicals. Maybe you've heard of serotonin, that's kind of our happy hormone. Uh, it actually interacts with serotonin as well. So when I'm talking about hormone imbalance, we wanna be looking at what are your hormone levels, estrogen, progesterone, are they balanced? But also, are those fluctuations actually revealing some issue with serotonin and other brain chemical levels as well? And the, the serotonin is known sort of as that happy chemical. So those can definitely affect our mood, which often um, is an issue around that time of our cycle as well, uh, the same time that we get headaches. So one of the um, biggest drivers of this imbalance I see is an overwhelmed liver. I call this liver congestion, where it just seems like the liver is just trying um, and there's just so much work for the liver to do to, to filter out all of these different uh, things in the body, including hormones. The liver eliminates hormones, it eliminates even environmental toxins, so there's, it's a lot that the liver has to do. So if there is a liver congestion, um, that can make your hormone imbalances even worse. So uh, one of the things that's gonna make this um, worse for your liver function is just regular consumption of processed foods, for example, and uh, exposure to environmental toxins, as I mentioned, and those Toxins could be coming from pesticides in our food or air or water. Um, they could be uh, heavy metals. It could be chemicals coming from our plastics and household products. Um, every single one of us are uh, uh, exposed to hundreds of different chemical toxins. And many of these have to be filtered through the liver. And so if you've got uh, already an overwhelmed liver with more of these toxins for the liver to uh, try to clear out and an excess of hormones like estrogen for example the liver just has a really hard time keeping up and trying and keeping your hormone levels uh, smooth as possible so we're going to see bigger fluctuations and just more of those symptoms from hormone imbalance uh, one of the things that makes it even worse for the liver is the liver actually needs energy and antioxidants and nutrients to actually help with that detoxification process. It's a, a, a very an energy dependent process. So 
that's another thing if we're not getting enough antioxidants in our diet then we're going to be slowing down that liver even more um, and then pushing that hormone imbalance even more uh, not only do we see the hormone imbalance get worse but also inflammation levels in our body and inflammation levels in our body can contribute to uh, pain like cramps as well um, and can also on its own contribute to brain inflammation does that make sense so far um, have you seen a link to headaches uh, with your cycles or uh, part of your uh, timing with your cycles um, if you have let me know what part of your cycle do you actually see um, your headaches popping up I would love to hear from you what you're seeing with that okay so that's hormone imbalances my third common cause that we see uh, uh, leading to recurrent headaches is leaky gut okay first of all what is leaky gut that is chronic inflammation of the gut lining which over time uh, disrupts the glue that's between the cells of our gut lining and that makes the gut lining even leakier um, and what that means is that there's things that like partially digested food that gets through that that leaky gut lining and it goes into our uh, bloodstream uh, other things like the uh, outer components of uh, bad bacteria can get through that uh, gut lining as well and into our bloodstream and that can certainly trigger our immune system to react to that and trigger inflammation now I mentioned that um, that that uh, the component of the bacteria that can get through that gut lining it's called LPS but that can actually get into the bloodstream and travel all the way to the brain and damage the blood brain barrier, which sounds bad, right? It is bad. Um, not only does that trigger inflammation in the brain, that actually makes the brain more susceptible to um, other things that are circulating in the blood circulation, like you know, uh, toxic chemicals. So that can create that, that brain inflammation that's there. Um, so what are the things that are actually causing our gut to become damaged in the first place, right? What's actually causing leaky gut? Uh, one of the most uh, common things that we're seeing is just processed foods in our diet, um, as well as things like gut infections, chronic gut infections, um, and food intolerances or food sensitivities, uh, chronic stress. Many of these things can cause indigestion but you don't have to have indigestion symptoms to have some leaky gut. Um, the leaky gut can be occurring and you might be seeing it as brain type of symptoms or headaches. So this is definitely something that if you have recurrent headaches, it's something to kind of move backwards and check, what's my digestion doing? Is there something going on in there that it can improve? Is my digestion as healthy and strong as possible? Are there some gut flora imbalances, yeast imbalances in my gut that I need to be looking at? One of the other things that we've already mentioned serotonin in your brain, but our gut actually produces most of the serotonin, melatonin, GABA in our bodies. We call these brain chemicals, but most of it is produced in the gut. So if there's something going on in your gut, you can have imbalances in those uh, uh, neurotransmitters like serotonin as well and that can be changing the way that your brain is um, uh, activated and um, changing the way that blood flows and the nerves are excited in your brain uh, our gut also produces histamine as well and that has effects in the brain as well which kind of leads me to my next point number four which is blood vessel changes this is a uh, one of the probably surprising and least talked about causes when it comes to uh, recurrent headaches, particularly migraines. So what we're talking about here is um, and many of my patients have already noticed over the months and over the years that there are certain foods that seem to trigger their migraines or make them worse. Um, so these are foods that actually affect how narrow or how wide or how leaky blood vessels are. So these compounds could be 
they're called tyramine, histamine, nitrite, nitrates, um, and caffeine. So these are compounds um, that can really affect and change blood vessels shape. Um, and these are compounds that are found both in processed foods, for example, nitrates and nitrites, you will find those in cured or smoked uh, meats. Uh, whereas histamine can be found in processed foods as well, but can be also found in fresh, whole, healthy foods as well. Um, so we're exposed to these all the time. Now, I'll do a little bit of a deep dive into histamine a little bit, um, because this is one that is less uh, talked about. Uh, histamine, you've probably heard about regarding uh, allergic reactions, right? Uh, certainly, uh, allergies can trigger the release of histamine in the body, and that can give uh, some of those symptoms of uh, asthma and respiratory issues or hives. So histamine receptors are on the skin and the lungs, but it, there are receptors also in the gut and in the brain. So having too much histamine in the body can actually come without an allergy. You can just get more histamine from our food or your gut flora, your gut bacteria can actually make more histamine. Um, and what can happen is that histamine levels can build up in the body if you've got more histamine uh, containing food or uh, even excess estrogen levels can contribute to this. If you've got leaky gut, if you've got chronic uh, stress, if you have genetic factors that make it difficult to break down histamine, um, if you have high glucose, that will also trigger histamine release. A lot of these things can um, build up in the body. And again, just like we were talking about with the uh, bucket, um, it can actually make the uh, fill up your bucket and at some point create that headache release. So honey, and this question here, uh, is histamine the cause of eczema flare-ups? Yeah, good question. Yes, so if there is a uh, histamine component to your eczema, which is quite common, if you're getting more histamine foods in the body, absolutely, it can flare up eczema. Absolutely, so really good question. Now, the, the question is now getting a little bit further from that is, so where is this histamine load coming from? Because it's likely not just because you ate avocado today that you're getting higher histamine. Usually there's multiple things that are adding up um, to finally create that histamine overload and where you're, it's actually showing up um, to headaches or to eczema flare-ups. So that's what um, is kind of the next step beyond that. Good question. Um, one of the things that um, what, what I would see is with histamine is that uh, most of the time your histamine levels are already quite high in the body and then just having like a, a few bites of chocolate, for example, that has, tends to trigger histamine um, can create a, trigger a headache. So a lot of my patients have told me, oh, coffee and chocolate tends to be really trigger my headaches, uh, which is common. Uh, but oftentimes it's because your body's already kind of a, has a high load of histamine or caffeine for that matter, which will take me to my next point here. Caffeine is one definitely that can trigger the changes in your blood vessel, uh, widening and narrowing. Um, so ca caffeine can be found not just in coffee and chocolate, but also in energy drinks um, and some medications even over the counter painkillers uh, can have caffeine as well. Um, and what we see is that regular, uh, when it's used on a regular basis, um, with more frequent basis, it's associated with more headaches. On the other hand, if you stop abruptly, this could be coffee, this could be even painkiller uh, use that has caffeine in it, if you stop quickly and suddenly, that can also cause a, uh, what's commonly called, called a coffee withdrawal headache, but that that dull headache that's really uncomfortable. Um, so generally, if you are drinking a lot of coffee or you have a lot of caffeine, uh, it's always a great idea to just try to reduce that, uh, especially if you tend to get headaches, uh, to try to reduce that, but reduce the consumption nice and gradual, um, no sudden stopping um, so that you, you're gonna avoid uh, kicking up those withdrawal headaches. Um, Interestingly, if you are using uh, or drinking uh, co coffee on a, a very infrequent basis, then if you get the odd headache here and there, 
coffee can actually help to relieve that headache in that moment. So, but you can only really use it as a tool like this if you're already not drinking it very often. So coffee can be a really interesting um, effect with our uh, uh, headaches and our brain chemistry. Um, and likely one of the big reasons why it has such a strong reaction is because caffeine can actually cross the blood brain barrier. So you can have this very strong, very fast uh, response in our brain circulation. Uh, a really great thing to do for both histamine and caffeine and tyramines and nitrates and these other compounds we haven't gotten into but also can change blood circulation is to do an elimination diet that avoids many of these compounds. So um, this is a way to just help to empty the bucket um, as much as possible and makes us just less susceptible to triggers. Uh, what often happens is when you do that, when you just take out a lot of these compounds doing like an, an anti-inflammatory elimination diet, once you start to reintroduce foods um, like a little bit of histamine from sauerkraut, for example, um, you don't notice it as much because you've already emptied that bucket. So uh, a great way to start is just doing the elimination diet and the anti-inflammatory diet. And then as you uh, reintroduce the foods, you can you notice that you're less susceptible, but you also get a really clear understanding of what are some of the really strong triggers for you because they tend to be quite uh, individualized to each person. So that can be really clear when you actually take those foods out and then start to reintroduce them. I hope that makes sense. Are there any questions about this? This is a huge topic I know and I hope that I can talk more about uh, even just all about histamine, um, I plan to talk more about that in a month or two. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, watch out for our schedule on that. Um, for me, this was a game changer for my headaches. Um, understanding uh, caffeine, histamine, nitrites, and tyramine. Um, and so I hope that that's helpful to give you a little bit of an intro on uh, what, where that's coming from and how that's related to headaches, um, but also how it can be related to other symptoms at the same time. Um, all right, last one. So we just talked about blood sugar imbalance, hormone imbalance, um, change, things that can change your blood vessels, um, and as well as leaky gut being uh, major causes of recurrent headaches. Okay, last one, stress. Stress we often downplay, but we know, most of us know with that stress can be an, a huge component of headaches and migraines. And how this is happening is that a lot of these uh, changes with stress in our body, cortisol, adrenaline, these can actually worsen hormone imbalances, particularly reducing progesterone levels. Um, this is something that I often see in women uh, going through perimenopause. Those hormone imbalances uh, tend to be uh, tipped to the scale of uh, excess estrogen and lower progesterone. And one of the biggest reasons why is because of that chronic stress. Uh, and keep in mind also, we talked about liver and hormone imbalance. That's a big, big piece as well. Now stress, chronic stress can also weaken our immune system. It can weaken our blood sugar control. Um, and of course you probably experience the muscle tension with stress, um, neck pain, jaw clenching, shoulder tension. Um, all of those um, can, can trigger a headache but also make any headache uh, worse or any body pain worse. Uh, there's also stresses that we don't notice as much. Um, and so these are things like chronic infections, chronic hidden gut infections, um, even nutrient deficiencies that are chronically there. Uh, chronic, what I call chronic jet lag, which is that disconnection from our day and night rhythm um, and nature's day and night rhythm. That can cause this chronic stress as well. That can trigger our adrenaline and cortisol um, to be triggered and, uh, as well and put us more in that fight or flight um, state. Uh, also disconnection with uh, disconnection from others like we talked about before, migraines can be quite isolating to not have you know any obvious sign of injury on our head, um, but having so much pain um, and not being able to relate 
to other people about what's going on can be really isolating and that can create a lot of stress uh, responses on its own, uh, making migraines worse. Uh, so regular stress management, we've been talking about a lot of this in the past few weeks, so I'd highly recommend looking at some of those videos to get some tools on that. Uh, but regular stress management um, is really critical for this. Specifically for headaches and migraines, I love acupuncture for this, because there's it, this works double duty. It helps with that muscle tension in the neck and the shoulder, uh, but it also helps to switch our nervous system from that fight or flight to the rest and digest. So it's just a perfect way to, um, to address a couple of those different uh, causes to uh, recurrent headaches. There's another stress that we um, don't really realize is always there uh, triggering inflammation, and that is toxic exposures from chemicals. And we talked about this earlier on with uh, hormones and liver health, uh, but this is something that we're all exposed to um, essentially 24 hours a day. Even newborn babies are uh, exposed to hundreds of toxic chemicals, unfortunately, now. Um, and this puts a, a huge burden on our liver to try to filter that out and try to control our inflammation levels. But a lot of times that inflammation there is chronic. And unfortunately, you know, we don't have nerve fibers in our liver. We don't know um, until we're way farther along um, that there's any thing going on in our liver unless we're doing a lot of testing or imaging. Um, there's no pain that our uh, liver can, can tell us that there's something going on there. So this is something that uh, we tend to just get uh, signs and indicators of poor liver health from things like uh, hormone imbalances and recurrent migraines um, and acne and other um, uh, little hints about our liver health. So this is something that we definitely want to uh, address as well by um, trying to re reduce the exposure to pesticides in our food, for example, uh, buying uh, grass-fed beef, for example, um, buying organic uh, Dirty Dozen list of produce, um, trying to get chemicals, uh, reduce chemicals that we get in our water, filtering water, um, reducing chemicals coming from our uh, household products. Many beauty products have a lot of uh, toxic chemicals in there um, that we have to be careful about. So. Uh, we are just inundated with these uh, toxic chemicals, so this is something that uh, we have to just keep working on both exposure as well as elimination by supporting our liver. So uh, recurrent headaches, as you can tell, is uh, involves really not just one, but usually multiple causes, the blood sugar imbalances, hormone imbalances, liver issues, chronic stress, um, and then there are those compounds that trigger our blood vessels to change, like histamine, tyramine, nitrates, nitrites, caffeine. Um, and for many of us, it's, it's not just one of those things. It's not just taking out chocolate that's gonna do it. It's not just taking out caffeine that's gonna do it. It's usually multiple different things that we really need to do to empty that bucket and reduce the recurrence of our headaches. And as you know, migraine headaches can be so debilitating. So we really wanna be treating that underlying cause to that headache um, so that we can actually return, um, uh, so we can actually uh, reduce that prevention or reduce that recurrence of headaches and reduce the amount of pain that there is. Um, and I think it's really important to think about headaches in general because uh, headaches can be a sign of brain uh, inflammation and that brain inflammation can actually make us more susceptible to anxiety and depression and, and Alzheimer's disease. So these can be really important a uh, signal of what's going on. Um, and the, the good news is that it is possible to address these uh, factors. Even though there's multiple of them, it is possible there's a lot that we can do with our lifestyle that can really make an impact and reduce the amount of headaches that you're uh, experiencing. Uh, so honey is saying, what about moisturizing? I'm just gonna see probably moisturizing creams and shampoos. Do they have chemicals 
as well. Oh my gosh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, this is something, what you wanna do is just look at what you've got right now. Um, you can check to see if they're on the ewg.org. Uh, so go to that website, that's Environmental Working Group. They've got, uh, I believe it's called, um, I can't remember the name of this database, cosmetics database, something like that, Skin Deep database, but they have a database where you can actually put in the brand of shampoo or the type of shampoo that you have or the beauty product that you have, and they can rate it according to the ingredients that are listed in terms of how dangerous it is or how uh, safe it is. That might be a good place to start to figure out um, uh, if there might be more chemical exposure in the, your cream or your shampoo. I have certainly seen that um, uh, with, I would say most shampoos that I've seen in my local drugstore um, have significant levels of chemicals, including hormone disrupting chemicals. So definitely check to see um, on that database and if you if it's not on that da database you can also just learn from there you know what are the chemicals that they're listing on there as harmful and keep an eye out for um, for those on your shampoos that you're choosing um, yeah such a good question there this is actually a huge problem I think um, and basically most of the products that I see out there um, I, I would uh, avoid <laughs> um, and so double check uh, shampoos, moisturizing creams, uh, conditioners, and then uh, cleaners as well, household products too. Um, dishwashing soap, anything that's that you're that's going on something that you're eating or that's going on your skin, um, absolutely double check that. Um, uh, oh, things like washing machine detergent or uh, dryer sheets, uh, just avoiding dryer sheets altogether and using a different, uh, you know, natural. Um, option is a good idea so lots of different ways that you can start to reduce your exposure yeah great question thanks for that so I think one of the things where after talking about all of these different uh, causes then how do we get started on reducing migraines when there's so many different causes right multiple causes causing and, and filling up our bucket how can you get started so one of my favorite ways to get started is doing a metabolic detox this is a great way to actually do an anti-inflammatory diet that removes most of those triggers we were talking about. Caffeine, tyramine, nitrates, nitrites, and definitely lower histamine. Um, so it empties the bucket right away. On top of that, a metabolic detox is designed to reduce inflammation, and it does this by uh, supporting the gut and the liver. So it actually helps to almost like a deep clean of the body, trying to get some of those stored chemical toxins out of the body. What happens is what a lot of these, the chemical toxins that end up inside our body, our body tries to protect us from them. So it stores these, they tend to be fat soluble. So they store these chemicals into the fat tissue of our body. So it's kind of away from the vital organs. It's a very smart, protective um, uh, uh, move that the body makes. Uh, however, when, to be able to take them out does take a little bit of work and it really requires the combination of not just liver supportive herbs, but an anti-inflammatory diet, reduction of uh, more uh, exposure to um, uh, environmental toxins. So a metabolic di a detox is such a good way of being able to do all of this at the same time. Uh, it also helps to support the liver and the gut so that we can rebalance our blood sugar and rebalance our hormones. One of my favorite um, benefits of doing a detox is how my cycles felt right after that. Um, a lot of our patients describe after the 10 day program feeling less headaches, feeling less puffiness, that fluid retention, um, having less hormone symptoms, and just having more energy and, and clearer thinking. So it can be a really nice reset for our brain. One of the uh, great added bonuses as well is when you're doing the 10 day detox, there's essentially you're doing an elimination diet or an anti-inflammatory diet. So you're emptying your bucket during that time and you're feeling great generally by day 10. After day 10, 
you can start to reintroduce the foods that you normally eat, but you want to do it strategically one by one. And that is when you can really learn about some of the strong reactions that you might have to food. And that could be coming from histamine, that could be coming from an immune reaction. Um, but that once you do that 10 day detox, it becomes really clear and you can gain a lot of information from that time. Uh, if you wanna learn more about a 10 day uh, virtual detox, register for our live uh, webinar. The link is in the video description now. Um, uh, I, headaches can be super confusing and frustrating, I definitely know, uh, but there are solutions and there are ways to reduce the pain and reduce that recurrence. Uh, I hope that you got some valuable insight today. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit of a hint and where to think about um, in your um, health, what you need to be addressing. Um, please share this video with friends or family that you think could benefit from this information. Um, I will be back on Monday, July 6th <laughs> at 1 p.m. Um, for one of my favorite topics, which is perimenopause. So you bet we will talk about more about hormones at that time. Let me know if you have any other questions. Uh, drop them in the comments now. If I, if I don't get them right away, I will get to them very shortly. Thank you so much for joining me today. That was so much fun. And if there's something you wanna hear more about, you wanna hear more about histamine, you wanna hear more about liver health, let me know. I'll be happy, happy, happy to address any of those. Thanks again for joining me. Have a fantastic day. All right, bye.